Well, thank you all for coming. Um, it's, it's, a real, um, it's a real pleasure and a sort of honor to be here, to be able to share with you some of the work that we've been doing and to learn from you too. So please feel free to sort of interrupt as I'm going. Um, and I'm going to try and cover a pretty broad body of work um, that spans a, a number of different XY variation groups. And um, my lab is based uh, here, as Erin introduced, uh, the National Institutes of, of Health in Bethesda, just outside DC. And our group is dedicated to trying to understand how variations in gene functioning, in brain organization, might be contributing to the increased risk for developmental difficulties that some individuals with XY variations have. Really important to drive home the point that Erin made earlier about variability. Um, but we want to try to understand how is it that carrying an extra X or carrying an extra Y chromosome can put you at increased risk for some, some of these difficulties. And we approach that question from a multidisciplinary uh, setting, a multidisciplinary perspective. So I'm a child psychiatrist with training in neuroscience and some, uh, done some work in genomics. We have statisticians on the team, social workers, uh, nurses, uh, psychologists. Um, database managers, computer engineers, uh, and the group really tries to work together to integrate clinical information uh, and hopefully to feed back clinical information in a way that's useful to families with some of the uh, biological measures that we're gathering too. And that's the work that I wanted to sort of share with you in the, uh, in, in the coming moments. So there's a history to the study of XY variations on this campus. So about 20 years ago, um, a mentor of mine, uh, Jay Geed, uh, was heading a lab that began to recruit individuals with XY variations. And this study focused uh, on brain structure um, and on cognition and behavior. And there were some uh, measurements, uh, some uh, biological material cells that were also drawn from individuals who came through the study. Now, although this study was done a long time ago, it continues to be really informative because one of its real strengths is that it gathered information across multiple groups, multiple uh, XY variation groups. And I'm going to come on in a moment to, to, uh, to run through why we feel that's so powerful, because I really think that if you want to understand one group, or particularly the biological contributions that might be relevant in one XY variation group, you actually helped by not just studying that group, but studying others. And I'll break that down in a moment too. So, this 20 years is a long time and lots of things happen in 20 years and we wanted to, to, uh, to revisit and to bring some of the advances that have happened in 20 years to the study of XY variations and that's what the current phase of research that we're doing is about. And this began uh, 18 months to two years ago uh, and the, what we're doing now differs from what was done before in a number of key ways. So we're taking advantage of uh, advances in genomics so we are delving deeper into how the functioning of the nucleus and the functioning of the cell might be altered by having an extra Y or X chromosome within it. We're also trying to tackle the issue that our organ of interest, where we're, we're develop behavioral developmentalists, is the brain. And the human brain is very difficult to sort of get at. So we're using stem cell technologies to try and take skin for participants who come in through to the study and to use that skin to engineer brain-like cells or neurons in a dish that we can study. Uh, the second uh, variation relative to the initial phase of research is, has to do with the brain imaging. So I said that the initial phase of the study was focused on brain structure. We're gathering a, a wider range of brain scans, so brain function and brain connectivity to try and combine that information. And the third thing has to do with uh, what happens in the clinical interviews with participants. So we're gathering much deeper, much broader information about cognition and behavior. And I think that's got a couple of functions. For, for one, it's trying to synthesize that information and give it back to families in the form of a report. And I'm really heartened to hear that many of the families who've come through, I think, have found that that report can sometimes push local services to do something that they might not otherwise have been so inclined to do. Uh, but from the science perspective, uh, we feel that if we measure behavior in as fine a grain as we can, that's going to increase our ability to draw that link, to follow the breadcrumb trail from genetic changes to brain changes to behavioral changes. So um, 
the, this phase began with XYY. Erin presented some of the results of the mental health assessments in the XYY participants that came through. And we're just starting the next components, which will be um, recruiting um, individuals and their families with XXX and XXY syndrome over the coming, uh, coming couple of years, starting uh, in a couple of months. So I said that we're based here, but actually I think of ourselves as one part of a kind of global network. So much of the work we do is in collaboration, is in a sort of big, big team science model. So we have collaborators in North America and in Europe who are really, uh, we're excited to be working with so that we can bring some of the sort of latest methods to this vast, these terabytes of data that we gather when participants come through the study. And our group at the NIH, as part of this wider network, is really trying to address there are three problems, three questions or challenges that I want to highlight that we were trying to tackle. The first is to provide a detailed picture of behavioral issues that can sometimes accompany XY variations. That's our goal number one. Goal number two is specifying the brain systems that seem to be most sensitive to X and Y chromosome dosage variations. The thinking being that if we can identify which brain systems might be responding most sort of uh, rapidly or be most sensitive to X and Y chromosome dose, that's a good system to start examining at greater depth because maybe we could understand this variability that Erin was speaking about by focusing on that system. Could it be that the reason that one individual with XYY is affected very differently from another could, has to do with how that particular system is, is configured, a particular network of brain regions? And thirdly, as I alluded to already, it's to look at things at the level of uh, the genome, to try and understand how the molecular consequences of carrying an extra Y chromosome could be modifying cellular function. And this is a much longer term hope, but, but one of the th ideas is that if we can understand how X and Y chromosome dosage modifies cellular function, maybe that will identify molecular pathways that can help us influence the course of the condition. But that really is a long term game that I'm describing there, a long term um, quest. So before I get into the findings, I just want to highlight a couple of approaches or themes that are really core to what we do. The first of them I've alluded to already, it's the importance of studying multiple XY variations at the same time. And this importance, this value is still there even if you really are focused exclusively on understanding XXY. And I want to break that down a little bit. The reason I think, one of the reasons studying multiple XY variations in parallel is so important actually has to do with something that happened a long time ago, with the evolution of the sex chromosome. So I'm going to give you a kind of quick run through. So as best as we know, about 300 million years ago, the X and the Y chromosome looked just like each other, the same way all the non-sex chromosomes look. They're kind of pretty much identical to each other with the same genes. And we think that, that this was the situation about 300 million years ago. And then what happened is the chromosome that was going to end up being the Y uh, developed a genetic variant that coded for male sex. And that meant that that chromosome only really ever could exist in a man. Because if you had it, you'd be a man. And if you didn't, you'd, you'd be a woman. And this event triggered a sort of parting of ways of the X and Y chromosome. What, th what this has led to is over these hundreds of million years, the X and the Y chromosome have kind of been evolving a little bit independently of each other. So today, they look differently. And you can see that one of the big differences is that the Y has sort of shrunk a bit. And this is more familiar, the large X and the small Y chromosome that I'm sure many of you are kind of familiar with. But there are some remnants of this distant past that they had in common. These are the blue bits at the top and bottom, the pseudo-autosomal regions. These contain the same, same genes on, on each, on the X and the Y, and they continue to swap genetic material when we make eggs or sperm. These little purple uh, uh, segments are meant to represent genes that have remained somehow, have been preserved from way back in time. So these genes are still the same on the X and the Y, even though they're not exchanging with each other, but they remain, they've been kept for some reason. And remember these, because I'm gonna come back to them at the end. And then you have genes that you only find on the X and the Y, the green genes that are only on the X and the orange genes in this case that are only on the Y. So you have the pseudo-autosomal genes, the non-pseudo-autosomal homologues, these purple ones, these are shared. So when you get an X and you get an extra Y, in both cases you get extra doses of those. And then you have the X-specific genes that only come with an X and the Y genes that only come with a Y. And this partial similarity and difference between the X and the Y chromosome is why studying multiple XY variations in parallel is so important. And I'm going to give you a concrete example of that. 
So let's consider XYY syndrome. Let's say you do a comparison between males with an X and a Y and males with an X and two Ys. And you see a change. You see a, you, a difference in a behavioral scale, a difference in a brain measure. Um, the likely fundamental causes of that are going to be the genes that are on the extra Y, right? And those genes fall into these three groups. When you get an extra Y, you get an extra dose of the blue genes, the purple genes, and the orange genes. So you don't know, is this brain change I'm seeing about the blue genes, the purple genes, or the orange genes? And that's useful. You want to try to know which sets of genes could be driving this, right? Now, if you study triple X syndrome, you have a similar situation where, let's say, you notice a change. Uh, in a laboratory, you compare two groups of individuals, XX and triple X, and you notice a difference. Um, the likely culprit is the extra X chromosome, the genes that are in extra dosage, and they fall in three groups too the blue, the lilac, and the green, but you don't know which one it is. Now, this is a simplification, but, but broadly speaking, I think that this kind of logic applies. Now, imagine you study both conditions in parallel, and you see the same change between 3x compared to 2x as you see between xyy compared to xy. And some of the measures we have show just that property. They're similarly altered in both conditions. Well, the only thing that those two conditions share are the orange and the lilac genes. So you narrow down your search space. So by comparing multiple conditions in parallel, you do a better job of being able to guess in this condition, is it something specific to the Y, or is it the bits of the Y that are also shared by the X? So it speeds up our search for uh, genes that could be contributing to what we're seeing. So that's the first thing that guides our work, comparing multiple groups together. The second thing, um, and this is really important, is this, this issue that, that Aaron mentioned earlier too, which is talking about differences. So often in science, in clinical science, we use the shorthand of saying group A has this compared to group B. And I think it's really important as I'm showing you these data, as I'm showing you things about difference in cognition, difference in behavior, difference in brains, that this is a statement about an average difference between two groups. And there's lots of caveats and ifs that we always have to hold in our mind when we're hearing this, as scientists, but also as, as, as parents. So on average, individuals with three Xs, let's say, might be performing below population average on task, task one. But as you saw with Erin's IQ plots, there's huge variability around that. And you have people that are performing above population average or much lower below population average. So that's one thing to bear in mind. The second thing to bear in mind is just because a person performs below average on one task, that does not mean that's going to apply to all aspects of their performance. So we all have our own strengths and weaknesses, which are important to understand in the science of the condition, but also in understanding an individual and trying to help them optimize their well-being. And the other thing is time, is that um, because of the rarity of XY variations, we don't really have a lot of longitudinal data where we've re-measured things in the same person over time. Um, so we need data to fill this in, but the important thing is that what you see in a snapshot clinical report is not something you're tied to for life, that there's lots of potential for change, and that's something to really, really bear in mind, again, both from the science and the clinical perspective. Okay, so I've given you those two kind of overarching uh, themes that guide what we do and how we think about what we find. Now, in the remaining time, I'm just going to get into some of the, some of the data. So, goal number one, uh, providing a, a, a more detailed picture about behavioral issues that can sometimes accompany XY variations. So, this slide summarizes, um, there are very few studies that have um, characterized mental health difficulties in individuals with XY variations using what we call gold standard tools. So an example of a gold standard tool is something like the case ads. And the reason it's not done that much is it's a lot of work. It can take three, four hours to do a systematic case ads and, 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 and integrate all the information. And there are very few studies. So there's one study done by our group looking at triple X syndrome. And these are the percentage rates according to this instrument, how, what percent of the people in that group of 35 had each of these diagnoses. Uh, there's a study in XXY that came from the Netherlands. Um, and then there's the findings that we've just had, which uh, we're working to prepare for publication in the 65XYY individuals who've come through the study so far. And 
these data tell a number of really important stories. One is that the rates of these conditions in the three groups are often higher than they are in the average population. Two, um, the degree to which the rate is elevated isn't the same for all conditions. So for example, for ADHD, which has a 5% rate in the average population, in males with an extra X or Y, you get up to about 60%. Whereas obsessive compulsive disorder is probably has something like a half percent rate in the general population, you have a three percent rate in XYY. So there is an elevation, but it's patterned. Some conditions are more high, are higher rates than others. The other thing to note is the rates differ across conditions. So here you have an extra X in the context of a, 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 a female with an extra X, and here you have a male with an extra X. And note the clear difference in the rate of ADHD. Now, this could also be because of study-specific factors about methodology rather than biology, uh, but it's important to note. Now, the, the thing I want to get into in the next few slides is I, I've shown you these numbers, and they're useful, and they're important to know, particularly for communicating, uh, for, for, for disseminating this information to care providers in the community who will be seeing families for the first time, but I also want to put some caveats. There's lots of complexity underneath these numbers, and I'm going to show this complexity by focusing on XYY, using the data that we've just been gathering. I'm going to unpack these numbers in a number of different ways. The first way I'm going to unpack it is something that you, you saw that, that Erin presented, which is the difference in the rates between individuals who've been prenatally diagnosed and individuals who've been, who received their diagnosis postnatally. And, you know, there can be really striking differences. So the rates of autism spectrum disorder were really only at 4%, uh, which is an elevation above the population norm, but it's considerably lower than a 19% rate. And this is um, understandable, firstly, in the context of the fact that often with XYY particularly, people get a, po a diagnosis because of the presence of developmental or behavioral difficulties. So there's a little bit of a bias there. This is the sort of ascertainment bias that we've been discussing. But it's important to note that even in the absence of that in prenatally individuals, that, that there is an increased risk. The second thing has to do with differences in terms of diagnostic setting. So Erin uh, again went through these figures, so I'm going to go through them briefly. But for some conditions, we saw people received a higher rate of diagnosis in the community and it lowered when we did it, like autism spectrum disorder. But others, it seems that they may actually be being missed a little bit in the community, like tick disorder, for example. And I think one of the reasons for uh, potentially missing disorders is, as I said, we spend three hours doing a mental health interview. So it's a very different thing to what you get when you go to a regular clinic. That might explain the drop. What might explain the fact that um, rates are higher in the community is really often a diagnosis in the community, really an important role of it is it functions as a gateway to care. So the criteria for making a diagnosis are somewhat differently applied in the community than they are in a research setting. And the third thing I want to unpack is what's behind a diagnostic threshold. So for those of you who aren't familiar, the way current tools for psychiatric diagnosis work is you ask questions and you tick where the symptoms are present. If you have enough of a certain type of symptom, then you meet criteria for a diagnosis and a person can be given that diagnostic um, sort of uh, uh, designation. And if a person doesn't meet those criteria, then they're thought to not have that diagnosis. And what I'm showing you here is people don't, we, aren't, we don't behave that way, we, we're not built that way. We don't suddenly stop when a diagnostic criteria begins. So if we relaxed our criteria a bit and said, well, you don't have to have all the symptoms of ADHD, but if you've got a few, then what are the rates? Then you see that the rates become more elevated. And that talks, that brings me on to this issue of dimensions. And again, Erin showed these data, so I'm going to, I think many of you here were, were here for Erin's session. But this just, um, just to, for those of you who weren't, on the y-axis, these rows are different dimensions of cognition and behavior. At the top, you've got general IQ, verbal IQ, so language tests, performance IQ, puzzle solving tests. And then the other rows below, from aggressive to withdrawn depressed, are the labels that exist on a scale called the CBCL that scores people for how much they're showing of a different type of symptom. So that's what this axis is about. The colored dots represent different XY variation groups. So in red, you've got XXY, in green, XXX, in blue, XYY, and in purple, XXYY. And then the X axis represents how far 
the average score of that group is shifted relative to the general population. So this dotted red line is the general population. So what you're seeing is for IQ, VIQ and PIQ, on average, there's, there's a lower score in those domains than the general population across all the aneuploidies, which is more prominent for verbal tasks than puzzle solving tasks. And then for the, for the behavioral dimensions here, they tend to have higher scores so that we see elevated rates uh, uh, parents will report that, that, their, that their children are showing elevated rates of symptoms in these, in these uh, domains. Now we can talk about this more towards the end if there's time, but I just want to try and give you a punchline to a large complicated body of literature that's looked at cognition and behavior in XY variations over time. There's lots of caveats, but I think it's fair to say that broadly speaking, there's evidence that carrying an extra X or Y chromosome impacts verbal cognitive tasks a little bit more than problem, uh, puzzle solving cognitive tasks. So more of a VIQ impact than a PIQ impact. And then in terms of domains of behavior, we often see prominent difficulties in areas of attention, mood regulation, and sort of social processing and social interaction. And those seem to be <coughs> present across different types of XY variation. So what I'm, um, just to summarize, that, there, that, that, that there's evidence that having an extra X and Y does put you at increased risk for cognitive and behavioral difficulties, but there's this ascertainment bias. A lot of samples already clinically known. We need to understand more about what the rates are in people who haven't come to attention because they have developmental difficulties. And the study that Nicole Tartaglia was, was announcing that she just got funding for is absolutely fantastic. I mean, to be in the field and know that that's going to be done is just a wonderful thing because that's going to give just that type of information. We need more, larger, deeper studies so that we can generate the consensus documents that we can help to educate future generations of care providers and existing care providers so families get a better experience when they go to clinic for the first time. And just to reiterate what I was saying before, there seems to be this particular sensitivity of language functioning, social functioning, and mood regulation and XY variation. And that brings me to the second goal of our research. Because if X and Y chromosomes impact behavior in a patterned way, not everything is altered the same way. Some aspects of behavior are altered more than others. The question then becomes, is that because X and Y chromosomes are impacting the brain in a patterned way? Are some brain systems more sensitive to X and Y dose than others? And that's the question we're trying to address in our second area of work. And we do that using neuroimaging. I'm going to try and perhaps foolishly do a sort of quick neuroimaging uh, primer. I actually found this quite helpful doing myself. It reminded me of uh, things I'd forgotten. So how does this work? So we measure brain anatomy uh, with magnetic resonance imaging, and we process those images with computers. And I'm going to show you some of the results that we get. But how does it actually work? Well. For those of you who haven't been in while I've, I, I tend to fall asleep in them when I'm in them. It's a bit like a womb-like experience. So you lie on this table, you're, you're sort of slid back into this donut, and the donut has a magnetic field in it. And the way MRI works is it, uh, it, is it, is it um, manipulates hydrogen atoms in your brain or in the tissue that's in the machine. So when you go into the scanner, you see these balls spinning with the arrows. Imagine those as hydrogen um, atoms. And when you go in the magnet, all the hydrogen atoms point the same way. Then the magnet does, hits another, it sort of it, um, starts another magnetic field that pulls all your hydrogen atoms pointing in a different direction. So when you go in, it points them all the same way. It hits this field, and then the field switches off. And then you'll see they start popping back to where they were before. Look, there's one that's popped. Now this one pops back. And the speed at which they pop back depends on whether they're in that, how much water they're surrounded by. And when they pop back, they release energy, and the machine reads that energy, and that energy map is this, essentially. So that's how this image is made by the MRI machine. Then we feed that image into another computer that can generate uh, models of the brain for a person. So this is, I'm showing you that the outside of a brain spinning. This is the folded cortical sheet. And then when we have these computer models in each individual, then we can start comparing groups of individuals and asking, well, which bit of the brain seems to change its size most if you compare groups that differ in X or Y chromosome dose. So this gives you an example of the sort of study design. 
that we do this work in. So this is about 300 individuals, um, 80XX, 89XY, and then between uh, sort of 20 and, and 50 XY variation groups spanning triple X, XXY, XYY, XXYY, and five XXXXY. And in all these individuals, we have the same scans. And we can ask, how does brain anatomy vary as a function of X and Y chromosome dose? Now, some of you who went to the earlier talk would have seen this, but I'm just going to run through it again. This is a summary image from one of our analyses. And here, what we're asking is, at 80,000 pinpoints across the surface of your brain, how is the surface area of that pinpoint changed by how many X and Y chromosomes you have? We, we made that map separately for X chromosomes and separately for Y. And what we found, and what I'm showing you in the summary image, to our surprise, is that the relative surface area of these points, these 80,000 points, in certain, area, in certain places of the brain, responded the same way to increases in X and increases in Y dose. So where you're seeing red, these regions expand in their relative size as you add X and Y chromosomes. Where you're seeing blue, these regions contract in their relative size as you add X and Y chromosomes. And notice they're bilaterally symmetric. They're not everywhere. They're just specific points that seem to be really showing this effect. And again, this striking convergence between the X and Y, even though I showed you in those cartoons how different the X and Y chromosome look. So that's a mystery we're trying to unpack. And we saw exactly the same phenomenon for a different aspect of the cortical sheet. So you can think of the cortex like a uh, sort of really thin, big vanilla cake. I guess it's got surface area, but it's also got how thick the cake is. And here we're asking, we're looking at thickness at 80,000 points. And again, in the red regions, they got relatively thicker, whether you added X or Y. And in the blue regions, they got relatively thinner. Since this 2014 study, we've been working hard to extend analysis to different parts of the brain. And I'm showing you two that we studied here. This is the striatum. So it's a clump of neurons sort of deep inside the brain that's richly connected to the cortex and helps in sequencing and behavior planning amongst a number of other things. And then here at the back is the cerebellum, which was traditionally thought to be just important for motor tasks, like fine control. But we're realizing now it's actually really involved in uh, the circuits that regulate uh, language and, and planning and complex thinking too. And when for both of these structures, we saw the same thing that we saw for the cortex. So just like in the cortex, there were specific sub parts of these structures that seem to be really sensitive to X and Y chromosome dose. And the X and Y chromosome effects were the same, surprisingly. So there are these hot spots within the cortex, the striatum and the cerebellum that are similarly sensitive to X and Y chromosome dose. And when we step back and looked at these regions, they sort of map out a distributed brain circuit or a set of distributed brain circuits <coughs> that seem to be really important for planning complex behaviors in the future, regulating attention, regulating mood, and language and social processing. And that was striking to us because those domains of cognition are sort of relevant to some of the things I was telling you right at the beginning of the talk, are relevant to some of the difficulties that we see at increased rates in the clinic. So, some evidence, I think, that the selective influence of X and Y chromosomes on behavior is underpinned by selective influence of X and Y chromosomes on brain organization. That's evident across multiple different aspects of brain structure. So just to recap that, we find hot spots of the brain that seem to be particularly sensitive to X and Y dosage. We really now need to understand how um, we've just focused on anatomy so far. But now, using the other data that I mentioned that we've been gathering, we need to understand how connectivity between these regions, amongst these regions, between these regions and the rest of the brain, functioning within these regions, is that also uh, altered or are other, are other systems involved in, in, in those domains? And we also don't know how stable or dynamic these are over time. So we need repeat measures from the same individuals to see, are these changes things that are sort of there in middle childhood and stable throughout, or do they, do they vary? And I just want to highlight this real mystery for us. I showed you how different the X and Y chromosome are. There's some similarities, but grossly they're very different in their gene contents. And how could it be that these two very different chromosomes can have overlapping effects on the brain? 
and we think this may have to do with those genes, the blue ones potentially and the purple ones that I showed you, that the two chromosomes share, and that's what we're following up right now. And we're following that up at the level of gene expression, and that's the third and final part of, uh, of, the, of the sort of data talk that I wanted to go through. So the logic here is that we see changes in brain organization and in behavior and cognition th that come along in many people with carrying an extra X and an extra Y. And a sort of, um, um, I think a sensible question to ask is, a sensible um, hypothesis to make or sort of a idea to propose is that the reason you're seeing those changes has to do with the way having an extra X and a Y alters gene expression. You're getting extra genes that people without the extra X and Y don't have. So what are those extra genes doing? Are they on? Are those genes, is it the case that but those genes being there and being on starts to interfere with how other genes are functioning that aren't on the sex chromosomes? What are the molecular consequences of carrying extra X and Y chromosomes? That's the question we want to address. And the level at which we're addressing that is mRNA. So we're measuring mRNA as the output of a gene. So you can think of it as a measure of how hard the gene is working. So we're systematically across the genome measuring how hard each gene is working. And then we're comparing that across groups that vary as a function of X and Y chromosome dose. So just to give you the study design, this is a reminder of the cartoon I showed you, genes that are shared between the X and Y and genes that aren't. We had about 70 individuals from these different uh, groups, XX, XY, individuals with a single X, triple uh, X, XXY, XYY, and XXYY. The first version of this work um, used what's called microarray technology to measure mRNA, to measure how hard the genes work. And you can think of that as a carpet, each little strand on the carpet is, um, um, is, is designed to stick to the product of one gene. So you extract the gene products from a person's tissue, you wash it over the carpet, and you see what sticks. And based on what sticks, you know how much each gene, how hard each gene is working. And we first asked a really simple question. Um, are there any genes out of all the 20,000 genes that we had measures on that always change their expression when X dose is altered? And are there any genes which always change their expression when Y dose is altered? And you can see that in this um, study design, there are multiple independent contrasts that feature an X dose difference. So there's an X dose difference here. 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 So we had 15 different X dose differences and 16 different Y dose differences. So we said, only give me the genes that always change across all 15 X differences or always change across all 16 Y. And out of 20,000, we found 10. And it was interesting to think where these 10, to see where these 10 genes were. They were all on the sex chromosomes, which is kind of reassuring, not that surprising, because they're the chromosomes that you're looking at dosage differences in. But of these 10 genes, eight of them were those purple ones. You remember I said those were the purple ones that were kept over from way back in the day when the X and Y looked like each other. And for some reason, nature has not wanted them to disappear from the Y. They've been kept. And we think that's because they may be very biologically important. And it's interesting that those were heavily featured in this set of genes that what we call dosage sensitive. So just to rephrase that, we find that the genes that almost have to change their expression when you change X and Y dose seem to lie within this small set of evolutionary preserved genes, these X and Y homologues. And if you think about it, th we're looking at this in, in blood tissue. So I've told you about brain so far. But if that phenomenon also applies in the brain, that could be a reason, that could explain how the changing X and Y dose can have such a convergent, similar effect, effect on brain anatomy. Because it's actually, if these genes are responsible, you get, them, you get an extra dose if you get a Y, and you get an extra dose if you get an X. So we're actively following this gene set up. And then the other finding of note, um, came when we asked how the rest of the genome, how all the other 
19,990 genes vary as you alter X and Y chromosome dose. Now these are complicated analyses, but the best way of describing them is that we, treat, we approach the data in a way that defined, first defined clouds of genes that hang together. So genes don't act in isolation, they work in gangs. So we first looked at the data set and found gangs of genes that seem to hang together in their expression. And then we asked, how do these gangs, so now we weren't looking at 20,000 genes, we were looking at 18 gene gangs. And we said, how do these gangs change their expression when you alter X and Y chromosome dose? Um, and w one of the notable gangs was this, was this uh, well, there were three notable gangs that we, we color-coded, uh, a brown gang, a green one, and a blue one. And these all contain different genes. Most of, these, most of the genes in these gangs were not on the sex chromosomes. They were autosomal genes. And what was really interesting is there was a, a, a one gene that seemed to, we believe, control the level of expression in these big gene gangs. And that was one of these purple genes on the X chromosome. So just to sort of unpack that, they seem to, these genes seem to be very sensitive. They, they lie on the sex chromosomes. They're very sensitive and they change their expression when you change how many sex chromosomes you have. And some of them also seem to be really important in controlling other genes in the rest of the genome. And that's, I think, important to understand if we want to try and unpack which, which molecular pathways might be underneath some of the uh, changes in brain structure, function, behavior, and cognition that I've mentioned. So some next steps. <clears throat> this sort of summarizes what I've just said. And we're building on this in four key directions. So we're now revisiting the question of gene expression as a function of X and Y dose using a larger sample of uh, individuals, using uh, improved methods for the measurement of gene expression. We're measuring other properties of the genome. We're, not, we're now looking at other aspects which are sort of uh, chemical tags that the body uses to control how much a gene is being read. Methylation tags, so we're measuring methylation tags and sex chromosome variations. Uh, in collaboration with a, a group, at, at an intramural research group just in a, in a building next door to us, we're asking how, does the, how is the nucleus where the X and Y chromosomes go, how is that altered by having extra X and Y chromosomes in it? There's an emerging field of science that suggests to understand, for us to understand how the genome is functioning, we need to look at it in three dimensions. We need to think about the chromosomes as kind of strings that are touching each other. And the way that they touch each other has got to do with how the genes are regulated. So if now you imagine a finely tuned sort of ball of chromosomes and you add an extra X chromosome, how is that shifting all the other chromosomes in three-dimensional space? And we're measuring that by taking pictures of individual cells from participants with a range of, of X and Y chromosome dosages. And finally, we've been taking skin from participants and, you, and converting it to pluripotent cells. These are cells that have the capacity to be gut, heart, brain. And uh, we, we want to use these pluripotent cells to make neurons in a dish, if you like. So we can begin to say, OK, well, what about in brain tissue? How do X and Y chromosomes modify gene expression in a neuronal cell? So far, I was telling you how that happens in a blood cell. And finally, uh, and I hope I've not gone over, uh, just one or two final slides to step way back. So I've shown you some data that we've been, um, we've been sort of poring over, examining behavioral and cognitive changes in XY variation, brain organization changes, and gene expression changes. But how can we link this to patient experiences? What are the pathways between this and care? And this comes under the sort of NIH motto, turning discovery into health. How, what are the roots for turning discovery in XY variations into improved health and improved health care? And I think about this, uh, I'm giving you examples from three different timelines. I think there are payoffs that we can hope to get in the short term. There are payoffs, there are medium term payoffs, and then there are longer term payoffs that are sort of potentially decades away. I think the short term payoffs are sim simple, um, sort of in, scientifically in a way, but powerful. Um, raising awareness about XY variations and encouraging the wider research community, people who aren't currently 
researching XY variations to come into the field and to do more work. To bring experts from other fields in, in, into, this, into this area, I think, is very powerful. And the second example of a short-term impact is what I said right at the beginning, simply doing the best job we can of describing what sorts of difficulties individuals with XY variations have at great detail across multiple groups at the same time, XYY, XXY, XXX, and getting that information out there to current care providers, but also to future care providers during their training, so that there'll be a better experience when families go and see that doctor for the first time. Some medium term payoffs that I think it's reasonable for us to um, um, you know, hope for in the next five to 10 years. Um, what, one of them has to do with bringing computers into this. So as I mentioned, when participants come through our protocol and they're with us for two days, we generate terabytes of data on you know, stacks of Blu-ray discs worth of data on each, on each individual and their family. And that data is, is too large for us to look at in traditional statistical ways where we pick one piece of the data and relate it to another piece. And I think we're hoping to use some of these computer-heavy computational approaches to ask the data, are there any aspects of gene expression or brain function or brain structure that can predict how severely affected an individual is? How can we use the biological information we have to explain that variation that Erin showed right at the beginning in the, in the dots in the IQ plot, for example? And I think that's going to be important as a first step of being able to hopefully, eventually, have tests that will allow families to know a little bit more about what's down the road or maybe even to make decisions about treatment. And, I'm gonna, and then finally the long-term ones that I mentioned uh, and these are really sort of this is getting into sort of dream science. We've started to identify brain circuits that seem to be sensitive to XY variation. They should be priorities in the future if we develop technologies that can safely modify brain circuits. For example, trans cranial magnetic stimulation is a, is a big area of interest in the intramural program. Can we target those nodes using these methods, um, these sort of safe and relatively harmless methods to potentially improve uh, outcomes? And the, the, uh, in even longer term, but I think ultimately very important uh, um, mission is to try and take this molecular information that I've mentioned into potential treatments, but that has a host of difficulties. It's important not to us underestimate, but it's also important to be up for the challenge. Um, and I think the finally, the most important slide is to thank the, the, the team, the huge team that's been part of this, and the, the biggest player uh, really is you. So thank you very much for being here, for your attention, and for supporting the science. Thank you. I think we have time for some questions. But I'll have to. What, what is the age at which, or the age range at which you start doing MRIs? So we see participants five to twenty-five years old in our protocol currently. It's challenging to to get uh, usable scans at the younger end of the age range. We try, and we have trained staff who help children go through a mock scanner to know what to expect. We have multiple goes, but ultimately we have to be led by the young person. And if, they, if they're not comfortable or they're moving a lot in the scanner, then we just won't do the scan or won't analyze it. So those are really good questions. I, I, the first thing to emphasize is that the data that I'm showing you, these aren't things that if you, if you looked at the picture of one person's brain, you'd spot it. So that's the first thing to say, that this comes out of computational analysis of relatively large numbers. Your question about connectivity is really important. So what I described are regional differences in brain shape or brain size, sort of hot spots that seem to change their shape or size most when you change X and Y dose. We don't know yet whether those regions are normally or atypically connected to each other or to the rest of the brain. And that's research that we're now able to do because of the extra types of brain scans that we have. So over the past 18 months, as I was mentioning, we've been gathering not just the brain structure scans, but also the brain connectivity and the brain functioning. So now within the XYY cohort and in future within the other groups that we'll be seeing, we're going to be asking, is this spot that on average seems to be altered anatomically, is its connectivity intact or is it altered? Does that address the question? Yeah, well, I mean, did any of your 
brain injuries prior to the study? So um, the, brain, the term brain injuries it can mean different things to different people. We excluded individuals who had a clear history of documented brain injuries. So if they had a concussion and they were out for a long period of time, for example, or if they'd had brain surgery or uh, brain a trauma that was documented and, and had been shown on scan to have a visible change in the brain scan, we, 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 we weren't able to, to include individuals like that into the study because of the, the very subtle, detailed nature of the measures that we're taking will be thrown off by those sort of big brain changes. Is that what you were thinking when you were when you were saying brain injury? Uh, well, we th th there's a this has partly to do with uh, changes in the MRI machines in our laboratory in our in our institute. So we're hoping that there's a chance, still a window for us to see a few more XYY individuals. Uh, and and J Jonathan Blumenthal and, and and the team will be happy to to speak with with individual families about that. And we're, we're expecting, though, that come the end of this year, this calendar year, we'd be shifting to, there'd be a change in machine, and we'd be shifting to XXX and XXY. How are you, how do you get to participate with XXY or XXX in your studies? Well, we're very fortunate to have a relationship with this organization for a number of years. Um, so uh, that's the primary way that we're hoping to get the word out. Uh, and I guess there are, there are lots of new ways that people can communicate through social media. That's not something we engage with directly ourselves. Um, but I think for some families, they find it helpful to share the experience of having come in, good or, good or bad. Yeah, there's information on the Access website. Yes. <coughs> and we've posted it on various Facebook groups, right. Access has, to publicize it. And then people that go to the studies often post about it on the social media groups to so say, hey, do this. Yes.